All right, let's start an, a new section um, talking about plant growth regulators and plant growth control. Um, this is uh, uh, other universities, and actually, there's a we have a graduate course in um, plant growth regulators. If, if some of you in graduate would like to look into that, um, <clears throat> I think it'll be taught this fall by uh, one of our postdocs. But uh, talking about chemical growth control, we have to remember that floral cult floriculture crops, floral crops have an aesthetic value. And we can enhance the aesthetic value of how good they look uh, by ma managing the plant height, whether or not it has flowers. Um, we can promote stronger roots. We can promote branching, give it a fuller plant. Lots of different things that we can do with uh, both chemical plant growth regulators and also we talked about temperature modification with diff um, last week. And we'll talk about uh, thigma nasty or thigmotropic responses here in a few minutes towards the end. So we talk about chemical growth regulators. And you'll hear the word hormone quite a bit. And um, what I'd like to ask you is, what is your definition of a hormone? Does anybody have a definition of a hormone? A chemical produced in one tissue that has an effect um, on another tissue in the plant. Exactly. A chemical that's produced in one tissue or organ that's translocated by a vascular system to another tissue or organ where its response is manifested. That is the classic definition of a hormone. And it was not developed in plant science. It was developed in mammalian science. It refers to um, organs that produce a hormone. And the key word is, is another key word is that it's, its activity is manifested by a um, a small quantity with a major response. Now, it works in plants in that a lot of our hormones, our plant growth regulators, more appropriately, are manufactured in one part of the plant, migrated to another. But a lot of times, it's, it's uh, produced in the same cell, and its action is, is replicated, is manifested in the same cell. Or something like ethylene or ethylene gas, which we'll talk more detail when we talk about post-harvest. Um, that's a plant growth regulator, but it doesn't translocate through a vascular system. It's, it's a gas. So we're going to talk about five categories of plant growth regulators. If you call them plant hormones, it's fine with me. Um, auxins, cytokinins, uh, various inhibitors, gibberellins, and ethylene. Those are the five main categories. Uh, some people also include a, a product uh, compounds known as jasminates. And that's way off in the literature, and we won't go there in this class. So kind of a classification sch schematic is that um, cytokinins, they're manufactured in the root meristems in some shoots. And since it's manufactured in the, in the, in the roots, its translocation pathway is through the xylem. Gibberellins are produced in, produced, produced in rapidly expanding tissues, uh, shoot apex, fruit, seeds, root tips, and it's primarily uh, translocated in the phloem. Auxins, again, young expanding tissue, moves to the phloem. And abscisic acid in more mature tissues, uh, older tissues, um, ethylene just about everywhere, and jasmonic acid in root shoots and fruits. What the plant responds to these, and this is just a small snapshot. When we look at cytokinins. When, we, uh, when a plant manufactures cytokinin, it's, it's stimulating cell division and cell expansion. And it's also involved in RNA protein synthesis, and it's also involved in apical dominance. In fact, uh, when we have high levels of cytokinins, oftentimes we lose apical dominance. Gibberellin cell expansion, um, you can s apply it to dormant seeds. It will break some dormancy of seeds. We can use it to lengthen our stems. Uh, cell expansion for auxins, um, apical dominance. When we remove apical dominance through pinching or shearing, we're actually removing an auxin source. 
So when the auxin source is gone, uh, which holds back the uh, buds that are quiescent or dormant, those are now receiving cytokinins and they are stimulated to grow. Phototropism involved in auxin. Let's come back to there. That's actually, um, well, we'll go ahead and talk about that. Phototropism in auxin is, in fact, the case. And what happens is we get an imbalance of auxin development, and auxin migrates to the uh, opposite side from the, from the sun and causes an elongation of that, which causes, creates the direction. You'll see in some books incorrectly saying that sunlight breaks down auxin. Well, it does in, if you have it in a bottle, but it's not breaking down the auxin in the stem, causing an imbalance. It's actually a migration of the auxin away from the sun, causing that phototropic uh, response or growing towards the light. Um, Psychic acid, it inhibits cell extension. It's, it's, it's involved with stomatal closure. It causes abscission of leaves and fruits. It induces dormancy. And it's an inhibitor of DNA synthesis. So it's an inhibitor. Ethylene, depending on plant stage, it does a lot of different things. Everything from germination enhancement to stimulation of ripening or senescence of foliage, uh, jump-starting abscisic acid metabolism. It does a lot of different things. And jasmonic acid is primarily involved in things like tuber development, uh, fruit ripening, seed germination, and these things. And you'll have to really hunt the literature to find any more than that. But here's your phototropic response. Um, if we have lots of auxin development, it's going to inhibit lateral shoot development. And this is what causes uh, a lot of strong um, single stem growth. We use it to promote adventitious rooting. Um, the auxins that we primarily use in adventitious rooting are endobutyric acid and naphthalene acetic acid. The natural auxin is endolacetic acid and it's not very stable outside the plant. In fact, uh, you have to protect it from any kind of light at all or it automatically degrades. So it's commonly used, uh, these are commonly used by uh, plant propagators for stimulating rooting. Some people think that actually the auxin doesn't stimulate the adventitious rooting, but it stimulates ethylene generation, which stimulates um, uh, the adventitious root development. But the literature is mixed, and Dr. Hughes is probably more up to date on that in what he's teaching. Uh, so it's involved in a lot of different things. Uh, we use um, a lot of auxins in a lot of different ways, 2,4-dichloro... Uh, um, phenoxyacetic acid, which is 2,4-D, is an actually an auxin herbicide, and it stimulates an auxin development, auxin acti auxin like activity, which causes plants to uh, overgrow themselves and actually grow themselves to death. So. Another group of plant growth regulators that we use a lot in the greenhouses are what we call plant growth regulators or plant uh, um, plant growth regulators are, are they reduce plant height. Some common ones, uh, old one, uh, common one is Florel, uh, which is actually a compound that produces ethylene. Atromec is a chemical pinching agent, uh, which actually reduces stem growth. Some people there was a time where we used things, products like Atromec where we were trying to um, uh, find a chemical that we could do chemical shearing without having to go and reduce the physical labor of pinching. Uh, Royal Slow Grow is an old plant growth retardant. And Offshooto is an another uh, chemical pinching agent. This is actually more like a soap that kills the apical meristem. And the idea with these uh, p chemical pinching agents was to eliminate the need for shearing or pruning. Ethylene, uh, we use a compound called ethophon. It's 2-chloroethylphosphonic acid. And it does all of these different things, uh, depending on the stage of growth. We can use it to induce flowering. We can use it to induce branching. It can do height reduction. 
it will also cause leaf drop. Um, in fact, uh, ethophon or florel in different forms is what the cotton farmers use to promote leaf abscission so when they go through with the, with the mechanical harvesters, they can pick the cotton lint off the plants much more easily without having leaves present. Um, flower senescence um, is used, uh, we use it to take flowers off uh, under certain conditions where we w might not want them. Uh, you have a question. Um, does ethylene always induce leaf drop? Does ethylene always induce leaf drop? The answer is no. It depends on how old the leaves are and the stage of growth. Ethylene is one of those chemicals that um, really has a lot of different activities and it's all variable upon the stage of plant growth. Gibberellins inhib inhibit root formation. Um, they stimulate flowering. They actually make a flower bigger. Uh, hobby gardeners will take a camellia and as the camellia bud is starting to expand, they can slit it open and put a couple of drops of gibberellic acid. It'll make the bloom even bigger and gaudier. Uh, some, some growers, uh, azalea growers primarily, will uh, spray this on to their azaleas to break some of that physiological dormancy of the azalea bloom for growing azaleas for florist market. And we can use it to increase internode length. So for instance, if we put too much of a growth retardant on, we can spray uh, gibberellic acid on to kind of counteract some of that growth retardant. But it's pretty erratic. Gibberellins, uh, cell elongation. We can promote root hair development. We can use it to prevent bolting of biennial plants, uh, primarily things like um, Oh, it promote um, <coughs> bolting of, of biennial plants like uh, plants like um, hollyhocks, because hollyhock actually has to go through a vernalization period. Uh, there's a lot of research on using gibberellic acid to replace the vernalization requirement to stimulate flowering. Uh, it's used to break uh, seed dormancy. Um, products like promalin are used to enhance the shape of some fruits, specifically apples. Um, the, the modern consumer on that red delicious apple uh, likes to have a nice elongated fruit with, with the prominent lobes on the bottom of the fruit. Uh, I particularly don't care for red delicious apples, but uh, some people seem to think that that bright red cardboard taste is, is important. Uh, I personally prefer Fuji's because I have a sweet tooth, buds and seeds, enzyme sense, um, synthesis, and so forth. Um, th what happens in, in the biology of a plant, when you grow a plant under low light levels, more gibberellins, and there's 30 or 40 different gibberellins now that they've uh, been able to chemically separate. Um, the plant naturally produces gibberellins when it's under high shade conditions, so it stretches and grows longer. And what it's trying to do is help it compete for that light. It's a, and in the greenhouse, especially in the wintertime, we have to combat that because the plants think it's growing in the shade, but yet we don't want to have that long spindly plant. So we use anti-gibberellin compounds to slow that growth down. High light levels, more GA is produced and plants are more compact. Also, anytime we put a plant under stress, it's going to release gibberellins. Okay? Um, we can see insect damage, uh, disease infec infection, uh, environmental stress, all these kinds of things may increase gibberellic acid, so it's also a plant stress indicator. So the site of application of a gibberellic acid is, is in the inner node of a rapidly expanding tissue. And so, for instance, here is a, a Benjamin Fig. This is one of uh, the same plant grown under light, low light levels, and you can see how the inner nodes are elongated. And under high light levels, the inner nodes are short. Okay? And that's a typical response. And then, uh, when you, if you were to take this plant and move it into low light conditions, 
it's going to get under stress, it's going to start to produce gibberellic acid, and then um, it's going to stimulate abscisic acid formation, and you're going to get an abscission layer, and somebody silly like me is going to walk in there and shake it in the bank, and <laughs> all the leaves are going to fall off. Okay. So gibberellic acid uh, biosynthesis occurs um, pretty much like this. Memorize this quickly. It's as much as I'll show you. Um, different growth regulators work on gibberellic acid synthesis. When we have mevalonic acid, mevalonate um, goes different directions. And one of the things that when we start putting in anti-gibberellins like paclobutrazole, which is a product called Banzai. Um, this gibberellic acid metabolism is, is, is interrupted. And when we interrupt this, this process, some of these chemical compounds become chlorophyll. So if we apply anti-gibberellins, we have more chlorophyll, and they're a deeper, darker green. Bonus. So. These are the different growth regulators we use, uh, like uh, these products here, um, anti-gibberellins work in different places. So when we use these anti-gibberellin compounds, and we'll talk about each individually in a little bit more detail, the plants are going to be shorter in spite of the shade. They're going to be stronger and tougher, darker foliage, more flowers, it's going to have the same number of nodes because it's only affecting the internode length. So they'll appear fuller, and that's why we use them. Remember, we're going for an aesthetic process. And they're going to be more tolerant of drought stress. So we can grow plants with closer spacing by using these anti-gibberellin compounds. More plants per unit area, more dollars per square foot, they are going to have better color and bloom response. And since they're stronger and shorter, they're not going to bust apart in the truck. And they're going to last longer in the retail environment in spite of that uh, sales associate that forgets to grow water that plant. And finally, we're maintaining it at an optimum market size for longer periods because if it's not of the market size that your vendor has requested, you're not going to be able to sell that plant. OK. So some of the plant growth retardants that we use uh, have different kinds of chemical response. Uh, these are really old chemicals that I think that about the only place you'll ever see them mentioned is in your textbook, Embark, Atramec. Atramec is still sold on the market, uh, and, and Royal Slow Grow, which I haven't seen in 20 years. Um, these are type 1 plant growth regulators. They disrupt cell division. Whereas the modern gibberell anti uh, um, gibberellins now are actually uh, disrupt cell elongation, and that's A rest, B9, bonsai, psychocell, sumagic, and top floor. So they all have different levels of water solubility. They work in different places. B9, um, originally sold by Uniroyal, uh, Uniroyal gave it up and um, became. Um, Crompton chemical, and now it's being marketed primarily by um, Olympic horticulture. Psychocell is Olympic horticulture. A rest is Cpro, top floor Cpro bonsai is a Syngenta product, and Sumagic is a valent product. And these are all uh, chemical plant growth regulators that are manufactured by primarily pesticide companies. So let's talk about some of the primary ones. Chloramiquat goes by the brand name of Psychocell. It's an anti-gibberellin. We use it as a height retardant. We can apply it either as a, foli as a foliar spray or a soil drench. Okay? It's been around forever. It's, a, it's basically a salt, so it's going to cause some flora uh, yellowing. Um, but when the crop is done, we usually don't notice it. It's been around for a long time. Dimenazide uh, is B9. Um, it's also an anti-gibberellin. And to get more uniform response, a lot of growers 
for years and years and years, for decades actually, have blended it with chloramiquat or cycocell for a more consistent activity. Anybody ever heard of dimenazide before in another context? Okay, dimenazide used to be used heavily in uh, the apple industry. And what it would do is, again, would anti-gerberillin, it would promote fruit color and promote uh, the fruit shape that the market was demanding. A uh, medical school decided to do a, a cancer study on this product. And lo and behold, they discovered that dimenazide causes cancer. And it was got, it got, was, um, that information was um, discovered by a couple of movie stars. Meryl Streep was one of them. And they went on the rampage to get this out of the market. And at that, and what is the primary market for most apples in the United States? What's that? School children, primarily Jews, primarily Jews for school children and for infants. So of course it got really passionate. But for you to consume, this you, because you're small, to consume enough apples to get the exposure that they used in their laboratory procedures, you would have to eat two bushels in the next 24 hours. <laughs> Two bushels of apple. That's, huh? You probably could. You probably could. I know you could. <laughs> You'd be the most regular people on campus. So what happens? It was bad science. If you took that much, if you were exposed that much aspirin, you'd get cancer. Are you afraid of taking aspirin? I take aspirin every day because my doctor tells me to, so I don't get a stroke. So this has been totally eliminated from the food market. And in fact, there are no chemical plant growth regulators, oh, excuse me, except for one, that can be used on a food crop. None. So we have to do something else if we want to control pl plant growth. And in fact, Greenhouse grown vegetables, there are not very many pesticides, and, and most greenhouse vegetable production is pesticide free because we have to have bumblebees in the greenhouse, therefore, it's pretty safe. All right, so enough on dimenazide. And Simidol, uh, sold by Cepro, it's A Rest, it's uh, anti gibberellin. This one is active as a spray or a drench, um, it's pretty expensive. So it's used on higher value crop like Easter lilies and also a lot on plug production for holding plugs. Uh, two other products, paclobutrazole and uniconazole. I put those on the same slide because they're actually isomers of one another. When the Syngenta company patented this chemical, they ignored its sister isomer and didn't patent it. It was picked up by a different company and now they're battling each other. So. These are very widely used. They're anti-gibberellins. They have a very, very high activity. Whereas we're applying products like dimenazide at two to three hundred, two to three thousand parts per million. We're applying these at twenty to thirty parts per million. So you need to know how to calculate parts per million, and you need to also know how to measure accurately. So precision is a must because if you overapply these chemicals, it gets really bad. So. B9, we apply 2,500 to 5,000. Psychocell, 800 to 1,500. And you can see we get into these, these compounds like ARES, Bonsai, and Sumagic, and these are all triazole inhibitors. And triazole inhibitors uh, actually come from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, a lot of the triazole drugs are used for treatment of things like nail fungus and stuff like that. Fingernail fungus is what I'm talking about. So which PGR to use? Almost all growers have everything in their arsenal. Because depending on the time of year, depending on your plant response, depending on, on the green, your greenhouse, your production practices, they're all going to need something. 
And what you need to do is keep records, talk with the distributors, read your magazines. Trade magazines are important. Uh, as a grower, you should all learn to start reading trade magazines on a regular basis and look at data from research reports. Um, things that affect how well your PGRs work is your spacing, how you're feeding the plants, the varieties, the cultivars, the temperature of your greenhouse. For instance, products like um, Sioux Magic and Bonsai, if you look on the label, you'll see they have a, a label for the southern United States and a label for the northern United States because depending on how hot your greenhouse depends on how well they work. Um, Plants like plugs are going to be really, really responsive to your plant growth regulators. Like, see, this middle one here is a control, and you get on the outside, you can see these plants, these plugs are much more tighter. So they, if you're using plugs, because a lot of our plant growth regulators are picked up by the roots, it's very easy to overdo it, and they will stimulate, and they will also... Um, have a tendency to over stunt. In other words, the plant will never grow out of it. Um, we can see here that um, bonsai on uh, treated plants are on the left and um, we've control some of the bloom so the plants are generating more roots so we've kind of used it for controlling bloom induction. Uh, some, uh, growth, some growth plants, this is the uh, poinsettia that's an untreated check and where this is one application of 10, one application of 20, but oftentimes we get more uniform activity with lower rates but more frequent applications. If we use lower rates with a more frequent application, though, it's going to give us problems. Yes? When do you apply things like this? When do you apply things like this? Okay. When you apply the uh, plant growth regulators, you probably, in crops like poinsettias, uh, most of the foliar applications of, of are going to interfere with bract expansion. So we want to do this before flowers are being shown. And you want to do this at such a time where you get uh, prior to a major stretch and what the primary thing you need to do is look at your own records and look at the timing, look how much sunlight you've had. A crop like poinsettias, if you have a dark fall, you're going to apply more plant growth regulators. If you have a bright fall, you're going to have to do some other things to manage it. And we use a process called graphical tracking to determine when we're starting to get out of our tracked rate, growth rate, and that's what you use to schedule your PGR application. Good question. So we can use all these different ways to apply. We can spray it, we can drench it, a sprinch, which means a mixture of a spray and drench. <laughs> and that's actually what we do on plugs. We call it a sprinch. Okay? I'm not making these words up, believe it or not. You can spray the surface of the media. Uh, some people, I've seen people dip the whole tray. Um, some growers will soak their, soak their Easter lily bulbs before they even plant them. And I've seen some people use seed treatment. In fact, we have data that shows she, seed treatment of plants actually will promote uh, some activity as the plant grows. This is what happens when you use too much of a plant growth regulator. These, uh, when bonsai first came out, um, a lot of growers didn't, were trying to spray it like dimenazide, like uh, uh, B9, and these plugs will never grow out of that treatment. And that's a shame because you're not being able to uh, sell that plant. When we use a spray, most labels for greenhouse regula plant growth regulators are written at a label where we're going to apply two quarts of spray mixed up on 100 square feet. And two quarts of spray uh, on 100 square feet of foliage is, is a concept that we call spray to glisten. OK? 
okay? Spray to glisten. In other words, if you're just getting it wet enough to start to glisten a little bit. If a lot of insecticides, especially um, products like insecticidal soap and oils that we call spray to drip. If you use spray to drip in plant growth regulators, it's going to drip into the soil and you're going to get a double dose. So we use spray to glisten. Um, drenches, um, typically we're going to put on about four fluid ounces per six inch pot, which is half a cup, two fluid ounces for four inch. And when you get to sprinch, that's where you need to start learning how to do it. Soil media, um, some people will put that right after seeding to make sure that the hypocotyl doesn't stretch too far. And uh, we use it, the triazoles, which is A rest, B9, no, A rest and uh, bonsai and sumagic, 5 to 15 parts per million, and that'll just keep our seedlings a little more compact. Being a good applicator, whether it's plant growth regulator or pesticide or anything, um, you need to use uh, a good sprayer. Oftentimes, it's best to use the same person because one individual might spray a little different than another individual, and you won't have a uniform crop. Okay. Um, Monday applications different than Friday applications? Why would they be different? Does the plant know what day of the week it is? <coughs> They're trying to get done. Okay. So sometimes you think about. You know, a lot of people like to apply their pesticides uh, before a weekend, especially in a commercial operation, when the next day we don't have a lot of people. Plant growth regulators are treated like pesticides. They have restricted entry intervals. And so if you're, trying, if you're pushing it to a Friday, the, the worker's attitude is going to be different than a Monday. So you need to pay attention. Um, you need to know how the plant growth regulator is taken up. Products like B9 and Psychocell, they're taken up by the leaves where bonsai, su magic, and A-rest are taken up by the stems and the roots and not by the leaves. So you have to actually have a directed spray if you want to get it on the stems or apply it as a drench. So you need to know what they're doing. Aggressive plants, multiple applications are better than single applications. Uh, WAT refers to weeks after treatment. You have to wait a week or so to see your application effect. And what you do is you go in and look at the difference in the elong elongation of the internodes. After application, the, elongate, the, the internodes will be shorter. Before application, they'll be longer. And when you start measuring your internode length, that's how you can use to schedule your spray when you need to repeat it. Drench applications, if you apply one drench, you're pretty much done. And so forth. So a little more specific on the individuals. Uh, we already talked a lot about diminazide. It's a hydrazide chemical, geobiosynthesis. Uh, it, affects, uh, it affects geo, the gibberellic acid biosynthesis late in its manufacturing cycle on the plant. So uh, it has a different activity. It's very water soluble. And we don't spray it with other compounds, like copper compounds which are primarily fungicides. We put it in the morning when the plants are cool and the plants aren't transpiring. If we put it on there when it's dry, the, the, the product will dry up too fast on the foliage and won't be absorbed by the tissue. So we apply it early in the morning when we don't have a lot of dry weather, I mean a lot of heat in the greenhouse. And we're going to apply this with a wet, we're going to get it very wet. And of course, you don't want to apply sprinkler irrigation afterwards. So it's critical that the plant be well watered before you do this application, because you can't go in and irrigate over the top after you've sprayed it on. And like I said, it's through the leaves. One other thing about B9, for the novice grower, B9 is safer because we're applying it at 2,500 to 5,000 parts per million. 
and it's easy to push the plant out of it. Whereas some of the triazole compounds, it's not so easy to push the plant out of a mistake. And Semidol uh, or A-Rest, we use a spray or a drench. Um, the spray and drench activity is, is, is similar. It can be leached into lower levels of the pot. One of the thing about a rest is there's a hyd it's it's it, there's a hydrophobic layer on a, a chunk of pine bark, and actually a rest, bonsai, and sumagic are attracted to that hydrophobic layer, and it will actually tie up your plant growth regulator a little bit, and it's a physical physiologic physical chemical reaction. That makes so when we use pine bark in our potting mix, we have to apply a little more. Cycosol is a salt. Like I said, we it's oftentimes tank mixed with B9 for a good um, impact. It's very common in uh, chrysanthemums and in poinsettias. Paclobutrazol is is a triazole or conazole family. This compared to um, the diminozide, it impacts gibberellic acid synthesis earlier in the cycle, so it has a more rapid response. So sometimes people will apply a B9 cycosyl drench on a crop like poinsettias before the f first or second week of September, and then later in the season, prior to bloom initiation, they'll apply paclobutrazol for a little more uniform control. So they're using them, everything together. Again, it binds to organic matter, uh, especially pine bark. It lasts in the potting soil a long time. So if you use it as a drench and you lost that crop and you decided to, well, I'm going to reuse that soil on some bedding plants, it might stay in that potting soil and stunt your next crop. So once you've applied it to a crop, to the soil, you know, you're not supposed to reuse soil anyway for phytosanitary reasons, but some people do. You're going to have some potential problem. Um, it's stable at lots of pH, it's very UV stable, and we can clean, um, actually do it really well with water soaking. Sumagic, like I said, it's a sister chemical to bonsai. They're isomers of one another. And however, there's one important critical thing you need to know is that sumagic is more bioactive than bonsai. So for instance, if you've got um, a crop, one cultivar is more vigorous than another, you might switch between bonsai and sumagic. You can't apply them both at the same rate. A lot of people will use uh, Sumagic over Bonsai if they have pine bark in their mix. Because once you put pine bark in the mix, Sumagic and Bonsai, Bonsai is applied to peat moss based mix, and Sumagic is applied to uh, pine bark based mix, you're going to see uh, more uniform development. So that's impacted by the potting media in the soil. So it's a little active. And Sumagic now has a label for vegetable transplants only. In other words, if we have a crop of tomatoes that we're going to transplant into an agricultural field setting, we can use this product. And as far as I know, this is the only one. The triazole compounds, A-Rest, uh, A -rest, Bonsai, and Sumagic, are most actively absorbed by plant roots. Um, you can put them on any time. Um, smaller plants, um, we use a media spray or a sprinch, more consistent. It's very critical to be uniform in your application. Mm -hmm. 
like I said, pine bark will reduce the effectiveness. Here's a picture of the chemical compounds, and you can see they're very similar. Um, also, something to remember, too, is that both of these compounds, bonsai and sumagic, are, uh, can be absorbed into plastic. And if you drench pots with it, or if you dip, uh, dip the whole flat in that, that plastic is now contaminated, and it will give you a residual plant growth regulator effect. So we want to make sure that we don't reuse containers that have been treated with these compounds because it, it will stay in the plastic. And it's not labeled for any outdoor use or chemigation. So. Late season drenches, like we have blooms on them. Um, we can use these as a drench and not as a spray. And what they'll do, what a grower will do is go in, if they need to slow their crops down, tighten up the, the plant growth development. If we apply the triazole family as a drench on plants that are starting to color, we won't interrupt uh, bract expansion and we won't interrupt bloom development. So um, we can use them to stop plant growth. Um, and we're looking at plants that are not like if you're using this on bedding plants, you want to do this late season application on plants because you're not going to plant in the landscape because it's going to hold them. Like a poinsettia, we want it to look good, want it to be the same size and be the same color all during the Christmas season. But on a crop of impatience, the homeowner or consumer, when they plant them, they want them to grow. So you won't use them on a plant that you're going to put in the landscape late season. Okay. So here's a, a good example of how we can use um, on an impatience basket. This is without, the left plant is without any uh, plant growth regular application, where here we see an early spray on the right with a followed up with late drench. It gives us a more fuller, more uniform, more aesthetically pleasing plant. Which one would you buy? The one on the right. A lot of growers by keeping lots of data and studying what you're doing, we use combination treatments. Because some of these compounds are synergetic, they work together, especially B9 and Psychocell. They're synergetic because they work in different areas of the gibberellic acid metabolism. But you have to be careful, especially when you start mi mixing the triazoles and uh, B9. A lot of plug growers do that, but you have to worry about stunting a chlorosis. Um, and the thing is about blending these products, since they work at different parts of the gibberellic acid synthesis uh, process, is by only applying it once, you get multiple activity with less labor. OK. It reduces the number of applications and can give you a better PGR response. However, Less room for mistake. And if you make a mistake, it's hard to grow a plant out of it. And one of the calls I get on a regular basis is, I've sprayed this. What can I do to break it out? So um, this is a very consistent synergism, B9 and Psychocell, B9 and Bonsai for, uh, can use to overcome some basic stunting. B9 and Psychocell. If we do Psychocell alone, we have chlorosis. B9 and A-Rest. A-Rest is a very expensive compound. By blending it with B9, we get the effectiveness of the, of the A-Rest without spending the money. B9 and Sumagic, we're getting our diverse activity on our chemical metabolism. And Florel and a product like, uh, like Atramec, uh, Florel, we can use those for growth retardant, and pinching and height control. Different cultivars respond differently. Uh, you can use d combined growth regulators with diff and can combine your growth control strategies. Robin asked a minute ago, how do you know when to apply? And the basic thing to do is to do a graphical track. 
this is the University of New Hampshire flora track system developed by um, Paul Fisher. Paul Fisher is now at the University of Florida. And this now is being used for all the different cultivars and is specifically to use the graphical tracking technology today, you just log into the ECI website or the other plant growth plant propagator website. I think practicum last semester you guys entered in all this data, right? I'm still yet to analyze it all. And you can see across the top here, at this point they applied um, Psychocell, uh, Psychocell and B9, Psychocell and B9, and on they've got schedules to apply their plant growth regulator. So that's how you that's your decision making tool. What happens if you put too much on? Or the weather changes? You can use diff to push it. You can use negative diff to make it more stunted. You can use heavy positive diff to push it. Uh, some people will use, um, go ahead and space the plants tighter. Uh, but with that, you're going to have less air circulation, so you have disease problems. You can use um, gibberellic acid to push the plant out of it uh, if you've made a mistake. But I'll tell you up front that that response is very erratic. Not every crop you can apply a chemical plant growth regulator. Or maybe you don't want to apply chemical plant growth regulators. Or maybe you want to be an organic grower because none of those chemicals are organic, even though they're organic chemistry. So you can use water stress to tighten up plant height. Go ahead and let the plant wilt. I go into greenhouses like Welby Gardens on a hot, bright, sunny day and they will actually wilt their plants to control plant height. All I want to do is pick up a water hose and water, because I can see them all grayed out, know that they need water, but they're using that to control plant height. They're also using it to harden it off. If you need to push stem elongation, you can overwater the plants, and that will cause stretching. Nutrient stress. We can use reduce the nitrogen level and it'll sh give us a shorter, more compact plant, but you need to be careful and look for your plant quality. Reducing phosphate in our potting mix will keep our seedlings shorter. So a lot of times when we're using plug mixes, our plug potting mix has very little phosphorus in it. Some growers actually use ex excess fertilizer, which gives us the same response as drought, because we're changing the osmolality of the mix to do the same thing. And of course, nitrate nitrogen compared to ammoniacal nitrogen is going to give us a more short plant. In nursery crops, sometimes by using a smaller container size, we can restrict plant height. But it's not as um, not as uh, uniform of a plant response. Which gives us to some work that's being done by uh, Dr. Joyce Latimer at uh, Virginia Tech. And she's come up with a process of, that we call brushing. Now, uh, it's an activity called thigmomorphogenesis. Anybody know what thigmo refers to? I heard it. Touch. Thigmo means touch or contact. Okay? Thigmomorphogenesis. In other words, we're touching this plant. We're regularly touching the plant. And we can, and what her original research, what she was doing is she took a rack with some PVC pipe and just pushed it across the plant two or three times a day. Just brushing the plant. And that regular touching of the plant would make the plant more short and more compact. Where would this be a good tool to use as a greenhouse grower? How many of the chemical plant growth regulators can we use on vegetable transplants? One. And that's only recently. 
most growers don't want any chemical growth regulators on them at all. So if we use this process, it's chemical free. We need to do it about twice a day, 18 days in a row, for this to be effective during a production process. It'll keep the plants shorter, more compact. What's the natural way that this happens? And actually, this is a great high school or junior high school science fair project. Get up and pet your plants every morning, then yell at the other one. The one that you pet every day is going to be short, compact, and full. The one you yelled at and didn't touch and ignored is going to grow tall, thinny, and lanky. Did you get yelled at a lot when you were growing up? Mm -hmm. I got lots of touching, so I'm shorter than you. It has nothing to do with it. Um, it's a thick monastic response. And so how would we do this in a greenhouse? Is it labor intensive? Absolutely labor intensive. If you do it Joyce's re uh, research way, and I think I've got the research papers on the website. So it's fun stuff to read. Question? Yes? Did you set it up with like a little biosystem? Yeah, like cook a, like cook a big brush, like, like a soft brush to like the brooms and just have it run without water? Yeah. <laughs> yes? I'm sorry? A poll, yes, polling, yes, mm -hmm. polling. Um, this is the way, and this is actually my manufactured image of a boom mounted brush because I don't have a picture one, but that works. Um, also, some other ways to do it is to get that thing. We can actually do it seismically um, through vibration, and I've seen people mount vibrators on their benches to do this. Um, moving benches, wind, any anything we do. How would you do wind in the greenhouse? We're talking pretty heavy wind. Le I've seen people use leaf blowers. And it works. Of course, you can make a pretty big mess with that leaf blower. So, But uh, it does work. Uh, brushing does work. It's, it's a thick monastic response. And um